Hare Krishna. Hare. Thank you for coming today evening. And today I'll speak on the topic of bring out the inner Hanuman. Bring out the inner Hanuman, not the inner Ravan. So, all of us live our lives with a combination of cooperation and competition. Now, for example, if we consider sports, say like football or cricket or hockey. Now, is cricket a sport of competition or cooperation? Both, Both isn't it? Yeah, there is. First of all, it's not just an individual sport, it's a group sport. So, there are, if we consider cricket, there are 11 players in it. And that means they are cooperate. You know, the particular player balls, a particular player bats, everybody has their position. And they play according to the position. So, first of all, there is cooperation in terms of everybody is agreeing to play one game. It is not that, say, one player, uh, the, bo uh, the baller is bowling uh, as a cricket ball and the batsman starts playing football with the ball. <laughs> no, <laughs> it won't work like that. <laughs> or, they're all agreeing to play one game. Not only are they agreeing to play one game, they are all agreeing to certain rules to play that game according to. Now, it's only when those rules are followed that actually the game becomes enjoyable. Hmm. I think just last year, there are two prominent cricketers from the Australian national team who were banned, or three players were banned, because they apparently cheated. And it was a, you could say the cheating was minor, but the outrage was huge. And one reason the outrage was huge was because in sports, what we, what the spectators wish to see is, is the, you could say super excellent or superhuman almost performance. And that performance and its excellence cannot be seen if somebody bends rules. So there is cooperation and of course if the two play teams are playing there is definitely competition but you could say the competition is embedded within a structure of cooperation. Competition has to be there but it is embedded within a structure of cooperation and when competition takes control over the cooperation or competition becomes more than the cooperation then what happens? Then, then players don't want to win according to the rules. They want to win at all costs. Or sometimes they want to win without considering the costs only. And then the whole fun of playing the game gets lost. You know, if say the batsman hits a ball and the ball takes edge and the wicket keeper is coming to catch it. And then suddenly the batsman decides that this is a game of mace fighting. And uses the bat as a mace to smash the, the keeper on the head. That would be outrageous. So basically, even in a game which is as competitive as cricket, there has to be basically a structure of, it's embedded within a structure of cooperation. And similarly, any society, that any social endeavor that we do, so society is competitive. For example, now there are different companies. Say if there are five companies which make computers, then when they're making those computers, uh, then at that time, each company is competing against the other company. But they are cooperating in the sense that they all agree what is it that the computer is supposed to do. And then we will they agree what a computer is, what a definition of a computer is, what a computer is meant to achieve. And then they compete about how that can be achieved most easily, most effectively, most economically. So similarly for us, we could say what applies to sports, what applies to economics, it also applies to our inner world. 
in our inner world there is both cooperation and competition now what is this cooperation and competition referring to at one level krishna says in the bhagavad gita say 14 chapter 10th verse that the different modes are competing with each other rajas tamascha vibhuya satvam bhavati bharata rajah satvam tamascha tamasatvam rajas tatha that sometimes the mode of passion modes of passion and ignorance are defeated by goodness <coughs> and then we act in goodness sometimes when passion defeats ignorance and goodness then we act in passion i mean sometimes we act thoughtfully sometimes we act uh, impulsively sometimes we act outright foolishly so the three modes can be summarized as some people make things happen some people watch things happen and some people wonder what happened so you know we could say that there are different forces acting which make us act so there basically there is competition inside us no doubt about that but along with that there is also cooperation what do we mean by cooperation over here actually the body mind and soul need to cooperate with each other for anything to be done say for example right now you are trying to hear this class and i am trying to speak this class so right now for all of you you are hearing the sound of my speech but you are hearing some other sounds also maybe some children are making some noise some people are doing some other work maybe your phone is giving out some signal also hmm? so all these sounds are coming but if our mind goes in various directions then if there is no basic cooperation between the body mind and soul we can't function properly in fact when say some children have hyperactivity disorders then what happens is that their body mind starts working in too many different directions and then they can't work constructively so um, we look at the forces within us and we can say that within us there are some forces which are good and there are some forces which are bad so within us there is a bright side and a dark side mm -hmm. so with respect to the cooperation and the confrontation or the competition we need to cooperate with our good side mm -hmm. and we bring out the best so for example varana ashram is the idea that whatever are our qualities and abilities we channel them constructively so we cooperate with our basic nature and we work accordingly but at the same time there has to be competition and confrontation with many of the impulses within us which can often take us in self destructive directions so in the ramayana which is of course a itihas that means it's a book based on history uh, told through the medium of poetry so there ram is the supreme divinity but we have hanuman on one side and ravan on the other side now of course the main battle happens between ram and ravan but the battle is you could say the first the reconnaissance the first entry and penetration is done by by whom hanuman hanuman enters and hanuman checks what all is happening and he gives a report to ram and then after that ram, uh, ram goes and attacks so similarly we could say the dark side within us is like the ravan side the bright side within us is like the hanuman side and it is not that uh, to go deeper we could say it is not that these two are necessarily distinct sides they are but underlying them is the consciousness which either empowers this or that this side or that side just like say if a student wants to study for exam so maybe there are two windows open one is the which is having the textbook uh, which is which is meant to be studied the other is having some movie which is just 
to be which is which is entertainment which can while away the time now both of them are two windows on the computer screen but the person who is observing is one and that person has to choose so we could say that there is a dark side within us there is a bright side within us but we are beyond both of them and we are the choosers in a sense the dark side and the bright side are not necessarily two distinct sides they are just the same force of desire which can be directed this way or that way so the same consciousness can be directed towards reading something constructive or it can be just uh, wasted in some pointless entertainment and that selection has to be made wisely so how do we <clears throat> make that selection see if we consider if we if we don't recognize say if i want to read something but that is not there on my computer screen itself i cannot read it if say there is some book which i want to which is open on my computer and there is some movie that is open now i don't want to watch that movie but first i need to read the book which is open over there then as i shift my focus here then i can move myself away from there so so now what directs our consciousness and how can we ensure that this consciousness is constructively directed i'll talk about three eyes for directing our consciousness these three eyes are basically intention intelligence and inclination so intention means what is it that i want to do some people decide that say that okay you know maybe it's a, we had a nirjal ekadashi recently so i said i'm going to fast without water okay but then after that uh they may they may start drinking water and they may start taking food this is what happened so i changed my mind <coughs> okay you change my mind and sometimes now fasting is difficult and we may not be able to fast sometimes it's okay we don't have to torture our body but sometimes we make some resolution and when we are not able to keep it we say i change my mind now did you change your mind or did your mind change you <laughs> did you that means that okay there is the screen open the screen open you know did i decide to just look at this screen instead of the screen or did i did that that is whatever was there on that screen appear so attractive that i got carried away by that so our intention is always the decisive factor and we need to strengthen our intention now whether we can execute that intention all the time or not that doesn't matter say for example it may happen at one level that we go on the net to read something constructive but then we get distracted so normally when we are reading a book in a book the author's expertise is that the book should be so well written that the, the author that the reader doesn't want to get distracted here there the reader doesn't get distracted here there but on the internet the same distraction is actually a virtue because when somebody is reading something if somebody gets distracted to some other link then that means that website will get more views or you go to advertisement the website will get revenue so in a sense the digital media is designed to distract us more and more it provides us content but there is also distraction over there so so presume that Uh, somebody decides that i want to read something and then they get distracted that's one way but somebody is just bored and say let me surf on the net to find something interesting and now what happens in the second case because there is no purpose the distraction is much much more likely because it said that when we don't stand for something we will fall for anything isn't it Oh, I'm just I'm just surfing to find something interesting. Well, this doesn't seem that interesting. That seems interesting. That seems interesting. We'll just get much more easily distracted. So, for most of us, uh, we can all begin with our intention. How strong is my intention? What is it now? How do we develop this intention? 
intention is at the ultimate level it's our choice it is we who desire and what, what intention basically means it could say that it's a uh, it's a desire that has uh, it, if you consider a child uh, in the mother's womb hmm, and as the child grows and grows inside then it comes to a particular point where it is going to be just to be born maybe in the 8th month, ninth month of pregnancy then it's very near delivery so similar so like that if we consider within our consciousness thought is like the newly conceived baby desire is like the baby who has gone for 3, 4, 5, 6 months intention is the baby who is in the 8th, ninth month that means by the time we come to intention then the delivery is soon going to happen so thought, thinking, desiring and willing these all happen inside us and as we move forward, 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 forward then what happens? Stopping it becomes more and more difficult stopping, uh, stopping it becomes uh, it, it, the force becomes very strong so for us intention comes when first there is thinking about something then there is the investment of emotion inside that and then there's a resolution to translate it into action say now consider suppose once there were three frogs who were on the edge of a of a well and out of these three frogs two of them decided to jump into the well so how many remained <laughs> one not really why because the two only decided <laughs> they didn't jump <laughs> so deciding is good but after deciding we have to do the action so if we consider Ravan and Hanuman now what happened with respect to Ravan was that he was in general very given to lust and then he had an intention I want to abduct Sita Ravan on the other hand was always very devoted sorry Hanuman was very devoted and Ravan's intention was to unite Sita with Ram to find Sita and then to facilitate the union of Sita with Ram so now for both of them their intentions were radically different and with these widely different intentions they both moved towards action <coughs> so now where does an intention come from? Mm -hmm. We could say intention comes just by inner, we get a thought and then we, as we invest emotion into the thought, then the thought starts growing towards an intention. Okay. We th that for example, now all of you come for this program today. So you had a thought, maybe I should go for the Saturday program. You thought, oh yeah, maybe I can have Darshan of the deities, maybe there's a nice class, we'll have a nice kirtan, nice atmosphere. As you invest, your emotion, yeah, it will nice, let me go there. And then you may come to the intention. So, quite often, when we are unable to do something, it is not so much that we lack determination. It is quite often that we just not nourished our intention so much. So, intention is something which we can nourish first by contemplation. When we invest emotion into our thoughts, then they grow towards intention. We all may have thought, hey, this is good, this is good. But when we invest emotion, yes, this is what I want. This is what I want to move towards. So it's, the, with the stronger the intention, our intention gives us like a momentum. When the momentum is there, say suppose somebody is driving a truck. And uh, because of a storm, a tree has fallen on the road. Suppose somebody is driving a truck and suppose somebody is driving a bicycle. Now if they are driving a bicycle and there is a, a tree fallen in between, they will just stop. But if there is a truck and the truck is moving fast, they will just push through, knock the tree aside and move on. So similarly for all of us, 
the strength of our purpose, the strength of our intention determines how many obstacles, what kind of obstacles will stop us or what kind of obstacles we will push through. Now one way intention is developed is as I said through contemplation, another is through association. Intention is basically as I said, it's solidified strengthened desire. We think, we desire and then we act. So, if we want to maintain an intention, any kind of intention, generally, if we consider somebody develops into, somebody becomes a, develops a bad habit and becomes an addict, it's usually because of some kind of bad association. So, they associate with uh, somebody who's an alcoholic or somebody's a uh, drug addict, but they associate with someone who is doing those things. And from that, the desire gets transferred to them. So, if we want to maintain any intention, then association is very important. We are very strongly social creatures. And that means that whatever we do, we need some kind of acceptance or validation or approval by at least some people around us. Now, sometimes when I am giving a talk, Sometimes the audience starts looking at me as if they are watching a foreign language movie without subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> then when that starts happening, then I have to recalibrate what's going on. Is it that? You know, maybe I am speaking something too abstract, or maybe I am presuming that the level of the audience is somewhere higher where the audience is very new. So if I start seeing all blank faces. Then what happens? That gives me some kind of feedback and I need to recalibrate at that. So same way, any action that we do, we, 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 are, we are very, because we are social creatures, we respond to the kind of feedback that we get. So if we develop a particular intention, then if we are around people who also have that intention, then sustaining that intention becomes easier. So Ravan, he was demoniac and he surrounded himself with people who were demoniac. And when Vibhishan tried to stop him, what he did was, he kicked Vibhishan away. And then there was his demonic intention, nobody could stop it from him. And that led to his own destruction. So for us to nourish our intention, we need to contemplate on why I want to do this, invest some emotion into it and then Try to associate with those who can sustain that intention, who are also having a similar intention, whose feedback can sustain our intention. That is the first thing. Second thing is, you remember I three eyes? Intelligence. intelligence. Now, intelligence is something very puzzling. Why? Because sometimes there are people who are brilliant, but then they are brilliantly foolish. What that means is, they are brilliant, but using all their brilliance, they act foolishly. So, sometimes, you know, it's interesting that uh, among the professionals who smoke, Doctors rank somewhere among the top. Now we may say, now doctors know better than everyone else how, how smoking is harmful. But what happens is that knowledge is there, but it somehow it doesn't no, it doesn't translate into their actions. So Krishna talks about knowledge and intelligence as two different things in the Bhagavad Gita. In 1820 to 22, he talks about knowledge in the three modes. And in 1830 to 32, he talks about intelligence in the three modes. And knowledge refers to how we take in information from the outer world. Now, basically, we interact with the world in two ways. Through the knowledge acquiring senses, we take in information. Through the working senses, we act in the world. So, Krishna refers to knowledge as the way we look at the world and take in information from the world. And he refers to intelligence as how we act in the world. 
So just because people have a lot of knowledge doesn't necessarily mean they have a lot of intelligence. Intelligence is basically the capacity to mold our actions according to whatever wisdom we have, whatever knowledge we have, whatever wisdom we have. So intelligence, you can understand this in two terms. You know, it is the capacity to check our desires, check our impulses. Now the word check can have two meanings. Check can mean evaluate and check can mean regulate. Like we have security chicken. So at the security chicken, what happens? Evaluation. Okay. What is this baggage? What is the baggage? All the bags that are go through evaluated and some content in that bag will be checked. No, you cannot, they will be regulated. You cannot take this inside. So if somebody has some explosive, somebody has some different countries, you have different rules. Some countries don't have liquids to go through. Some countries don't allow, say, Australia, even if you go from one state to another, one province to another province, they may not allow fruits to go from here to there. So there is checking. So similarly, intelligence is that which checks whatever comes up within us. The thoughts, desires. So intelligence means it, it evaluates and then it regulates. So this capacity is developed primarily by studying scripture regularly. Now it's interesting, Ravan was also born in a, from a sage who was a Brahmana. And Ravan also knew a lot of scriptures. In fact, one of the most famous temples in India is in Varanasi. It is the uh, Kashi Vishwanath temple. And if you go in the Kashi Vishwanath temple, there is a deity, there is a Shivalinga. And on the opposite wall, there are prayers praising Lord Shiva. And those prayers are called Ravana Stuti. It is Ravana Stuti is not praise of Ravana. It is praise by Ravana. Ravana is a, considered to be a great worshipper of Shiva. And the prayers that he composed to please Lord Shiva, they have become so celebrated that they are often used to praise Lord Shiva. Like we have Brahma Samhita, the prayers by Brahma to Krishna. So like that, there is Ravana Stuti. So now to compose such prayers, it requires knowledge, it requires expertise. But what happened was, he had the intelligence to understand that Shiva has great power and if I worship Shiva, I will get power by that. But see, there is power and there is purpose. So he acquired power from Shiva, but he did not go to Shiva to know what purpose I should live for. In today's world also, technology gives us more and more and more power. But technology does not give us purpose for our life. So intelligence, it, it, it primarily centers on, like I talk about intention is similar to purpose. But tech, intelligence is what we, how we act in the world so that we can pursue the purpose that we have, that we have set for our lives. So although Ravan was intelligent in terms of understanding that there is a higher power and by, I need to worship that. But he, was, he went to that higher power to gain power, not to gain intelligence to understand what the higher purpose of life is. So this, so we need to study scripture so that our intelligence is nourished, so that we remember what the purpose of life is. We often may start with a good intention, but our intention can deteriorate over a period of time. And as it deteriorates, then we get, it's like, uh, Say we are we are going in a particular direction and our mind starts tempting and distracting us and we don't even realize while we are driving the mind makes us take a not just one left turn or right turn, the mind can make us take a U-turn. So the very thing we have decided not to do, we end up doing that. So intelligence is what helps us. Once we have set an intention, intelligence helps us to keep moving along that intention. And <clears throat> nobody ever desires to become a bad person. Nobody thinks that in the future, when I grow up, I'll become an evil person. So even people who are, you could say people who are evil, 
they also don't train their children to be always evil isn't it yeah, even if say somebody is a gang uh, is a criminal or a gangster or a don or something if they have their children they will at least have to train their children you have to trust me isn't it you have to obey me you have to respect me so nobody grows up uh, nobody starts off or grows up with the express intention to be evil but what happens the mind keeps small things small things small things okay just do this a little wrong little wrong little wrong and then they end up doing terribly wrong things so it's a uh, this way that eventually our, unless our intelligence is strong we go against our values and <clears throat> beyond the intelligence so there's a second point intelligence so to the extent we nourish our intelligence to that extent we will be able to sustain ourselves we may start off something but to sustain we need our intelligence and the last third was inclination, inclination. now inclination is something very it's subtle but the idea of inclination is that say if the floor if this floor were inclined in this way water will naturally flow in this direction so similarly for all of us our consciousness is inclined in certain directions <clears throat> and to the extent we understand where our consciousness is inclined to that extent we can adapt it accordingly so now one easy way to understand the inclination of our consciousness is to think what do we think of when we have nothing to think of <laughs> so now for most people what do you do when you have nothing to do you pick up your phone okay your phone has some new message come up somewhere but so, so that might be now if you consider maybe 20 years ago smartphones were not so common but that doesn't mean people were not smart <laughs> isn't it <laughs> so there were so, so why i am giving this example is see inclinations are learned so when smartphones were not there at that time our inclination might have been something else now, if we have nothing to do then we might uh, we might turn on the tv or we might just go out for a walk in nature or we might pick up a newspaper mm. so we might do different things so basically we all have certain inclinations now not all inclinations are necessarily bad nor are all inclinations necessarily good so the developing an intention and developing the intelligence is something which we need to do with conscious effort but with respect to inclination it's more a matter of self discovery i talked earlier about how there is cooperation and competition within us so competition can mean confrontation this has to be so with respect to intention we can have many desires but we have to make sure that our healthy desires are stronger <coughs> than the unhealthy desires with respect to our intelligence there may be many many things come up you know, do this do this do this do this no i want to focus so with this intel intention with respect to intention and intelligence often there is a confrontation involved over there multiple things will compete for our attention and we have to choose what we focus on but with respect to inclination it is more more like we understand what we are inclined towards and then we see how that inclination can be used in a healthy way for some people the inclination might be to read some people the inclination might be music some people their inclination might be socializing mm. now some people love to gossip you know what is gossip gossip happens when we hear something we like about someone we don't like <laughs> <laughs> Oh really? I thought uh, sometimes you know some people we don't like, and then if we hear something good about them, stop it. I don't want to hear. But we don't like it. We hear something. Oh, tell me more. Tell me more. Is <laughs> it? And if there's nothing more to tell, I will tell it to more to people. Is <laughs> it? So when we hear something we like about someone we don't like, that's when gossip starts off. 
So now socializing is something which is again I said a human need. The how much different people want to socialize that may vary, but that's an inclination. The inclination to mu for music, inclination for socializing, inclination for reading, inclination for going in nature, inclination for doing some artistry, some painting, some. So we all have certain inclinations. Now, those inclinations are not to be given up, but those inclinations are to be used in such a way that they can raise us up. So if we like to read, now we might be habituated to say reading maybe just some mundane novels or maybe just reading news. And from there, if you want to shift to reading something which is more uplifting, that will require effort, no doubt. But if somebody who has a habit of reading, we tell them stop reading. That will be very difficult. Shifting the content of our in, uh, of our reading is actually easier than changing the inclination toward reading itself. So what what I'm meaning by this is, see the floor is inclined in this particular direction. Then the that means somebody naturally when they have nothing to do, they will want to read something. That's their default inclination. So what we need to do is, with, we work with our inclinations. We can't work against our inclinations. But we work with our inclinations in a way that is healthy. So for example, the water is flowing in this way. Now if the, here the water is all getting clogged, but there there's a pipe. Now the water is going to flow in this direction, but we don't want it to flow in here in this side because it will clog. If you flow in that side, it will flow away. So those who are Brahmanas, they like to read, they like to study, they like to teach. Those who are Kshatriyas, they like to manage, delegate, uh, control, confront. That's what they like to do. Now at one level, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita 16th chapter that the, to think that I am the controller is a demoniac mentality. Ishvaro aham aham bhogi, siddho aham balwan sukhi. In the 16th chapter, 13, 14, 15 verses, he talks about how thinking that I am the Ishwar, I am the controller, is demoniac. But then the same Krishna, when he talks about Varanashram, about the characteristics of various Varanas, in 1842, 43, 44, 45, there he talks about the Kshatriya characteristic. And there he says that. Dhanam Ishwara Bhavascha Shatram Karma Swabhavajam. So it's Ishwara Bhav. Ishwara Bhav, Bhava is emotion or disposition, inclination, and Ishwara is controllership or God. So Krishna is saying Kshatriyas have a quality of Ishwara Bhav, of controllership. And he is not talking that in the negative sense at all. He says that they have charity, they have fearlessness, and they have controllership. So now, isn't controllership a bad thing? Not necessarily. It's we. Some people have the have the inclination to control, but for what purpose are they controlling? See, every every society needs some kind of organization. An organization means there will be some people who will be in control. Isn't it? So, for example, now, if there's a large group of people and maybe some accident has happened, some violence has happened, now so there can be some leaders, some people who might take a leadership role and they may incite the people for riots. And that same people, somebody else might uh, speak over there and pacify them. So, in general, everybody may envision, oh, I want to be a leader. But it's not like everybody has a deep inclination to go about and take the responsibility of being a leader. So Ishwara Bhav, some people, you just put them in a group, they will naturally emerge as leaders. Uh, they, will, they, will, they will just organize, you know, you do this, you do this, you do this. And people will, people will accept. You know, okay. And because, because what happens is that those who have that competence to be leaders, Everybody after some time understands, you know, if this person is in charge, we all will work together better. So the capacity to control that inclination is itself not bad. But for what purpose that inclination is utilized? So Ravan, we can say he was evil. But Ravan in his own way was a leader. 
Now he led the Rakshasas on many occasions and he led them to various victorious camp campaigns and he awarded those who fought with him and fought for him. They were all very prosperous. Lanka was said to be a golden city. But you know, it was all simply with the attitude of use and throw. And use and throw was literal. Every night when the Ramayana war would happen, at the, uh, uh, after the, for the daytime the war would happen, night time, when everything would be dark, Ram would stay awake late into the night and all the Vanaras who had died, he would pers personally perform their last rites. And every evening, every night when the war would stop, Ravana had given a standard instruction, all those Rakshasas who have died, pick up their bodies and throw them far into the ocean. Why? Throw them into the ocean? He says, next morning, when the fighting starts, if the Vanaras don't see any Rakshasa bodies lying on the ground, they will think yesterday we didn't kill anyone. And they will become disheartened. So those who fought for him, those who laid down their life for him, what is he doing? Use and throw. Literally use and throw. Use them and throw them. So he was not really concerned about anyone. He was concerned about others to the extent that they were of some use to him. If not, just completely dismiss them. So he was a leader, but he was a very self-centered leader. So the inclination is all, we all have certain inclinations, they need to be channeled. Now Hanuman uh, was not when the group of monkeys went southwards to search for Sita. At that time Hanuman was not the officially appointed leader of the group. Do you know who was the leader? Angad. Angad, yes. Angad was the son of the erstwhile king, Wali. And because he was... Uh, in the royal line, lineage, so he was made the leader and he was very young. But although he was not the appointed leader, Hanuman emerged as a natural leader. Hanuman, uh, when Angad was, they had been told come back within one month and one month nearly passed away and they couldn't find Sita anywhere. So Angad became so disheartened and others became disheartened and they said that we will not be able to continue. And if we go back, we will go there in disgrace. So, Angad said, let us fast till death over here itself. He's, he, if he was apprehensive that just as Sugriv had killed my fa his father Wali, Sugriv will kill me also, have me killed also. And that fear was unfounded. But when this happened, the monkeys got confused. So at that time, Hanuman expertly found a way out. Hanuman tried to make Angada see sense. When Angada refused to see sense, Hanuman prayed. So it is Vanaradhuta Preshakarama Tadgati Vignat Dhamsakarama. So it was by Hanu Hanuman was constantly remembering Ram, praying to Ram, chanting the names of Ram. And the Lord arranged circumstances in such a way that Angad was pacified and Angad's Angad's face was also saved. Angad was not disgraced. And eventually, Hanuman emerged as the leader because Hanuman alone had the capacity to jump across to Lanka. None of the other monkeys had that capacity. And he used his extraordinary abilities to do unprecedented service. So for all of us, whatever inclinations we have, see, if we consider the circle of things that we like to do and the circle of things that are good, we can find out where the two intersect. Something which you like to do and something which is good. And we nourish that. We try to try to keep, give ourselves more and more access to do those things. So if we like music, then we like music, but we can try to focus more on spiritual music. If we like to read, try to have as much spiritual literature as possible with us. And that way, we can, we can work with our inclinations. If we start working against our inclinations, it will become like a constant struggle. If the water is flowing in this direction, and if I say the water should not flow in this direction, then I have to be constantly on the alert. No, push the water away, push the water away, push the water away. Now that will be, we will soon get tired of it. We can't do that constantly. 
But what we can do is, whatever is my inclination, how can I use this inclination constructively? So there is competition within us where certain urges we have to, certain aspects of our inner world we have to fight against them. But there is also cooperation. And when we act in this way, when we channel ourselves internally through oh, these three things, through our intelligence, through our intention and through our inclination, then we can start finding out that our inner world starts becoming lit. Our inner divinity starts manifesting. And although this happens gradually, uh, the process itself is evolutionary. But the product is revolutionary. The change in the long run that happens is enormous. Just need to keep moving forward steadily, step by step by step by step. And that's what Krishna tells that when we are doing this, yet tad agre vishamiva parinami amruto pamam. In 1837 he says that kind, any kind of disciplining of ourselves can seem like poison initially, but it will become like nectar eventually. When it becomes like nectar, then because we are purified, we work positively and we become our own friends. That means whatever is the dark side within us, it becomes sidelined. The bright side becomes strengthened. And then as the inner struggle decreases, then we can move forward much more positively, much more productively and much more purely. We become, we find happiness within us through our connection with Krishna and we become agents by which we can share happiness with others. And how much we can share with whom? That <coughs> Krishna can empower each one of us in extraordinary ways to do far more good than what we thought we were capable of doing. And that discovering how much Krishna can empower us, how much light can come within us, if we let the inner light, light within us illumine us and illumine the world out, that is our life's biggest adventure. Discovering how much we can illumine our inner world and how much we can illumine our outer world by Krishna's grace. That's life's ultimate adventure. I'll summarize. I spoke on this theme today of bring out the Hanuman within, not the Ravana within. I talked about how initially any game that we play, like cricket, it's a competition and a combination of competition and cooperation. But it is, you could say, competition uh, embedded within cooperation. Similarly, business is also like that, economics is also like that. So, similarly, self development is also a combination of competition and cooperation. So, cooperation means what the resources that we have, the bright side that we have inside us, we nourish that and take it forward. And competition means the dark side which we have, we learn to fight against it and curb it. So for doing this, I talked about three I's. What are the first I? Intention. Intention. Intention means it's the strong desire, a strong thought, desire which has just come to the level before action. So many times when we feel that we are not able to do something, it's not lack of determination, but lack of intention. So intention can grow by contemplation, so that when thoughts are invested with emotion, they grow to an intention and intention can also grow by association. We are very social creatures and social feedback affects what we do or don't do. And I was, second I was intelligence. intelligence. So I talk about knowledge is how we take in information from the world. Intelligence is how we act in the world. So many people can be very knowledgeable, but they may not be very intelligent. Like doctors might know or have a lot of knowledge about why smoking is bad, but they may still succumb to smoking. So intelligence is nourished by studying scripture. And it's not just like I study scripture and what happens when you study scripture is that we are reminded of our purpose. So when we can focus on the purpose, then we don't get distracted so much. Uh, our intelligence is, is sabotaged not by suddenly making us foolish, but it is made by slowly making us forgetful. So that we start taking one left turn, left turn, and then we take a U-turn. That's how our mind works against us. So regular study of scripture reminds us of our purpose. And once that purpose is kept firmly in our mind, then our intelligence can be, uh, can act in a way that that purpose is pursued. And the third I was? Inclination. inclination. So here, we all have certain innate inclinations 
and we can't uh, we can't keep resisting them constantly but rather we use the inclination so that we can bring out the good within us so what uh, to know our inclination we can look at we can think of what we think of when we have nothing to think about and whatever is our whatever our default habits we try to spiritualize them we try to use them in a good direction like to read we can't stop reading but we can choose what we can try to change the content of what we read we like to socialize uh, we like to talk with people we can't stop talking but instead of gossiping we can talk about something more meaningful talk about krishna talk about something more constructive and in that way we coop when in channeling our inclination we cooperate with ourselves with respect to our intention there is a competition and many things are prompting within us intelligence also we have to check check means evaluate and regulate so when we work in this way with by that combination of cooperation and competition we become illumined within and that inner light brightens our inner world and it comes out by krishna's grace and can brighten the world around us also thank you very much hare krishna hare. any questions or comments Hare Krishna happy to be of service Yeah question yeah in, in Krishna consciousness when we are engaged in service this mood of competition and cooperation also uh, comes into play Yes so how do we ensure that there is always healthy competition amidst uh, cooperation Okay, so how how do we ensure that there is healthy competition amidst cooperation? Yeah, it is based on what that competition makes us do. See, if the competition is a if say somebody is doing a lot of service, you know, once I was at a, in a community and the uh, the devotees were doing book distribution marathon was going to start, and they went to the the spiritual master and the leader in that community and they said that you know maharaj last time this uh, you know the it is in india the highest book distribution was 90000 books hmm? we want to distribute 100000 books this, this month uh, in this marathon and we want to come first so please bless us so maharaj so maharaj told him that yes i'll pray that you bless, you distribute 100000 books and you come last <laughs> Now what does that mean? That means book distribution itself increases. That everybody distributes a lot of books. So yes, if we distribute more books, other than distribute, inspire to distribute more books. So it's like if we keep the purpose in mind very clearly, our purpose is to help more and more souls to come to Krishna and to help ourselves come closer to Krishna. if we have that mood clear <coughs> then that then we then our whatever competition we have it won't become destructive it's like sometimes it happens that say if some people are coming to a temple and there are two three different preachers who are having their own programs or there are two three different spiritual masters who who give initiation so sometimes what happens that people get pulled now come to my program come to my program come to my program or you know take initiation from my spiritual master take initiation from my spiritual master and sometimes what happens people get so confused you know i should i go from this spiritual master or this spiritual master they may end up as so confusing forget it you know <laughs> and they may decide i don't want to have any part with all this only. and then it's like what is happening like somebody is connected with a particular uh, preacher particular spiritual master you know, we encourage them that way it's like say if we consider the krishna conscious movement is like a hospital and there are different it says in a hospital there can be allopathy there can be naturopathy there can be ayurveda there can be different departments which offer treatment now if somebody is taking if somebody is taking treatment from a particular department and other people come and pull that patient from that hospital bed no come out from there come over here well, the patient may say you these doctors are fighting over me better let me give over here give up and go away from here somewhere else so the purpose of the hospital is to treat the patients that is the primary purpose 
So if you keep that purpose in mind, then the competition will be healthy. So hey, if you understand, if there's an epidemic over there, there are many, many sick people. So the important thing is not how people are treated, but whether people are treated. Whether it is in this ward or that ward, under this doctor or that doctor, that's not as important as that more and more people are treated. So if we have that understanding of the purpose, that ultimately everybody needs Krishna. And our purpose is to help them come closer to Krishna. And also, what is it that we need? Now, whenever we set goals in Krishna consciousness, set targets, the purpose is not so much to meet those targets as to meet Krishna through those targets. What does that mean? That whenever we set any targets, actually those targets inspire us to become more committed and more absorbed in the service of Krishna. And that commitment and that absorption is what is going to be our lasting asset. So, we definitely want to have targets, but our purpose is not just to meet the targets. Our purpose is, so when we are practicing bhakti, our purpose is not popularity or even productivity. Our purpose is purity. So, now we can set targets and those targets may inspire us more and more and purity will come by that. Now, if productivity comes, popularity comes, that's also good. But that's not our purpose. So, if you keep both the external purpose, if we want to help others come closer to Krishna, and the internal purpose, that we want to go closer to Krishna, then we won't get distracted. Shall we stop?